not too long ago, I was part of, um, you know, I, I went on a series of adventures. Um, I've had the privilege of working at some of the most forward-thinking companies in the world in technology and in design, including Google and Adaptive Path. I've gone on to work in China, in the US, in Canada, um, other places in the world working in fields on projects ranging from sustainable agriculture to financial services um, and now to education reform. And along the way I did found a couple of uh, technology startups, one in t um, Toronto and another in Beijing and uh, partnered up with Chenny, one of my best friends, to found in an innovation consultancy called uh, Journey CX. And although this might sound super glamorous and exciting, while I was living it, it was really quite terrifying. And um, as Calvin said before on the panel, a lot of people talk about the, the you know, wonderful stories of being in successful startups, but not very many people talk about the, the pain and the suffering and the challenges that people really do have to go through to get there. And so, um, through all of these adventures, I really wish that I had somebody to hold my hand and say, hey, it's going to be okay. This is how you can navigate these challenges and potholes, and this is how you can make the most of your experiences and new opportunities. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't have someone like that early on in my career, and so hopefully today I can be that person for some of you. So, how many of you here are just starting to explore a new career, whether you're uh, still, still in school, a student, or you're a professional that's transitioning into something else? Can you give me a hands up? Okay, so most of you here. Uh, and who here is a little bit excited, but also a little bit scared of the uncertainty and the unknown? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I get you. <laughs> I was in the same shoes as you not too long ago. And um, I found myself on this ledge, overlooking this vast abyss in front of me, um, really scared of what might happen if I took a leap. And before I was a designer, before I was a startup entrepreneur, I was an engineering student. And I was a very miserable engineering student. I chose engineering because I thought it was a very stable and safe career path. Um, all of my friends were either going into medicine or in engineering. And uh, so I said, why not? I'll try it. Um, and as soon as I started my courses in it, I realized, wow, this isn't the thing for me. This isn't what I'm passionate about, and I'm not very happy. Um, so I found myself like this little bird, climbing up to the, the ledge and peering out. But I would always be scared back because of these thoughts like, hey, you're, you know, I'm doing really well in engineering. Why not just stick to what I know? Um, what if I go and choose another career and I completely fail at it and I can't get a job and I'm not good and I just, you know, I'll just fail at life and my parents will be disappointed and the world will come crashing down. So um, I would always get scared back into that safe zone. But um, after a really long time and a, uh, just feeling really depressed, I knew that I had to make a change in my life. And so I started to reach out to people. I talked to my engineering professors, professors in science and arts and psychology. I ended up uh, Googling all of these interesting companies I was hearing about and seeing what exactly are they hiring for and what kind of career could I have to end up working there. And um, through all of that exploration, I found myself um, uh, looking up this, this field called user experience design. And back in the day, it, not very many people knew about it. It wasn't the hot thing. But when I read up more and more, I realized, wow, this is exactly uh, what will make me happy. This is what I want. And I also thought about, hey, what's the worst that could happen? Like, is that drop really that far down? Um, and no, not really. I could always come back to engineering if things didn't work out. And so the risk wasn't that big. And um, after two years of having this identity crisis and near meltdown, um, I decided to finally collect all my courage and make the leap. And was basically this happy little bird flying towards the sun. And um, looking back on that decision, I know it was one of the hardest ones in my entire life, but it was one of the best decisions I had ever made. And 
Um, I know that we will all find ourselves on this ledge more than once, and they might be super high, they might not be that high, you know, big decisions and small decisions. Um, but something that I want you to all keep in mind is that, hey, if you find yourself on that ledge, there's a really good reason for it. Uh, and it means that where you came from, that safe, well-trodden path, isn't the place that's making you happy. And the only way to be happy and have a more fulfilling life is to move forward and to take that risk. And oftentimes that risk isn't as, as big as you think it is. So lesson number two for myself is that you hold the keys to your own cage. And what I mean by this is that you have the power to make yourself fly into the sun and, and be successful and overcome obstacles, or you also have the power to bring yourself down. And I, I did bring myself down many, many times. Um, and remember that story I just told you? Well, it was the best decision in my life, but it was also not the smoothest flight I had ever had. Um, because in order to uh, switch from engineering into design, I had to basically pick up my entire life. Uh, I was studying in Edmonton at the time. I moved over to a different city, to a different school, to a different program, to a place that, where I knew no one. And it was really scary and um, a really dramatic change. And that, uh, in addition to self-doubt, just um, made me feel like I was locked in this cage of negative emotions. I had thoughts like, what the fuck did I just do? Um, this was a mistake. There's no way out. I'm a failure. Um, this, this might not be for me. Like, what, what can I do about this? And yeah, I basically j just paralyzed myself with, with this doubt and fear. And I was there for a really, really long time, essentially in this big, dark hole that I couldn't get out of. And it was really strange because no matter what other people would tell me, um, I, I couldn't bring myself to believe them. Like I remember calling my dad every night, sobbing to my pillow, um, and he would say, it's fine. Like, what are you so worried about? Just pick yourself up and, and go forward with your life. But his words just rolled off me like rain. And I, I knew that this wasn't right. There was something not right about my situation. I had to get myself out somehow. And so I ended up reaching out to my school counselor. I was just so desperate at that point. Um, I couldn't function and I couldn't even bring myself to go to class. And I was hoping that going there, she could give me a 12-step program to happiness um, where you know, following these things will, will bring me joy and bring me out of this funk and it'd be easy. Um, but instead, she asked me a bunch of questions. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> like, why aren't you just telling me what to do? But I realized that uh, through answering these questions, she was actually helping me navigate through all of these negative emotions and helping me uncover that, hey, a lot of these were, were caused by false assumptions that I had about my current situation and myself. And that I actually had the power to change that. I was the only one with that key around my neck to let myself out of that cage. And so knowing that, I started to make things a lot easier. And that cage started to disappear. And I was able to do some small things to get myself moving forward. Um, some of the really simple first steps I took was just thinking about where my anxiety might be coming from. Um, so one, one example was that, hey, I was pretty feeling pretty anxious because I had nobody around me that I knew. Okay, well, I can do something about that. I can go to clubs day and sign up for six different clubs. And I did. And I ended up making a lot of friends, becoming a student leader, becoming really involved in the community, and I formed a support network around me. Um, another simple thing was um, that I was living in this dark, damp basement suite in rainy Vancouver <laughs> that probably doesn't do great things for my mood. And so I'm like, well, I can change that. And so I, I left and I moved into this, uh, this larger um, dormitory at school with bright, uh, sunlit windows and around people. And slowly, after acts like this, I, I started to change my entire outlook on life. And 
was able to make that cage disappear entirely, and I set myself free. And I bring this up because we build these cages of um, negativity around ourselves all the time. Um, this was a really extreme example, and in my darkest days, I had to take anxiety medication to get myself through these times. Um, but it really was all in my head. And uh, thinking back to this experience has helped make every other um, challenge I faced in life so much easier to overcome. Whether I um, was building a startup and, and you know, something failed, or I was working with really um, difficult stakeholders in a large client organization, I would always come back and think about uh, where is this anxiety coming from, what can I learn from it, how can I make it go away, and use that as fuel to help me fly forward rather than get mired in this. So, realization number three from all my adventures is the importance of putting your own oxygen mask on first. Um, who here has been in an airplane? Oh, glad to see most of you, yep. Um, and I'm sure you all remember the air hostess going through that safety ritual saying, please put on your own oxygen mask before helping others. And there's a really good reason for that because you cannot help others unless you yourself are healthy enough to do it. Um, essentially, you don't want to look like this beat up bird, um, all bleeding, saying, hey, please let me help you. And this is really relevant, especially for us uh, designers, because our job is to always help other people. We're constantly giving. It is our job to help serve our clients, our stakeholders, and our users, um, to help them um, have easier lives, to help them fix their problems, to help make their lives better. And that takes a lot. And um, unless you're a robot, you probably will have some emotional attachment to these people that you are serving. And doing that day in and day out will be very, very tiring, as it was for me. And I found myself um, being very passionate about my work, but slowly I, I lost all my energy. I started to lose some of that passion. I started to become really frustrated and, and stressed, um, and I almost yelled at a client and lost them at a certain point. And I realized, what, what, well, wait, I need to take a step back and figure out what is wrong. Um, it's, it's probably me. And thinking about all the things that I was doing, um, I realized, wow, I've been working on startups, I've been, be, I was, I've been working on this design consultancy um, basically 24-7, seven hours a day, um, every single day of the year, and I never really took time out to keep myself um, happy and well. I never drew those boundaries. I basically neglected my own well-being. And in, in doing that, I was actually making myself a much less effective designer and wasn't um, able to help my stakeholders and users as much as I could have. And so, especially in this last year, I've decided to focus, finally, on myself. Focus on putting myself first. And that starts with small things, like surrounding yourself with really supportive mentors and friends, people that bring you joy, that give to you emotionally, rather than only take away. Um, that also uh, looks like really thinking about the kind of work that makes you happy, the kind of work that you want to be doing and that aligns with your own purpose. So uh, I remember Jenny and I getting together um, many, many months ago, and uh, we were both quite tired out at that point. And we were thinking, hey, um, wh what is causing all of our frustration? And we made a list of the perfect client we wanted. We made a list of all of the things that, uh, all of the kinds of work that uh, would bring us a lot of happiness and joy, and realized a lot of our clients weren't meeting that criteria. <laughs> and we had to make the hard call of actually letting a lot of them go. Um, it was difficult because they were obviously paying us money, and money is good. But um, as soon as we let them go, we realized that, hey, we are now just emotionally and mentally free to put all our energy towards the people that we actually like working with. And we were able to also spend more time finding people that um, 
that's kind of aligned to our cause. And the more joy we had in our, in our work, the more people came together um, to want to work with us. And, and on a personal level, I um, realized the importance of giving myself more credit. Um, and seeing that I was good enough, and I remember that being mentioned in the panel before, um, that is such an important lesson to learn, that um, there might be other people uh, who are doing really unique things. There are obviously the Mark Zuckerbergs in the world um, being super successful, but look at yourself and look at the unique perspectives that you bring, the new, unique qualities you bring to every single project. Um, you alone, you are enough and you should give yourself that love and kindness that you offer to other people as a designer. And that has really made the biggest difference in my life. I am much more energetic, much more joyful, and I would say much more fun to work with because I am now taking care of myself and setting those boundaries to protect my well-being, which in turn does make me a far more effective designer and just a better person to other people. Lastly, I would like to share this learning, which is great opportunities are sparked by small acts of intention. And I am constantly amazed by how little things that I did many, many years ago have led to some of my most surprising and wonderful opportunities. So we obviously cannot tell the future and we don't know what's out there in the great unknown, but we all have the ability and the power to do um, small things right now. And uh, that could look like grabbing a coffee with somebody or going to a networking session or reading a book that might inspire your next startup idea. And for me, um, that's basically what I did uh, to spark every startup that I worked on and every uh, great job offer that I got. Um, so let me tell you one example. Um, so this was a story of my second startup, Snaplingo. It actually started um, with me in San Francisco, just walking along the street, and I happened to see um, this event that was going on uh, around design and in social innovation, two of my favorite things. So I'm like, why not? Why not stay? And I went and I heard the speaker talk and he was just so compelling that I ran up to him afterwards and um, had a quick chat. And he happened to mention that, hey, there's actually some really interesting design and social innovation work happening in China. I was like, oh, great. Well, I, I kind of wanted to vacation in China anyway. Um, so like, I'd love to explore what exactly is happening there. And so I followed the links that he sent me and found a professor out of Tsinghua University in Beijing doing some very fascinating work in sustainable agriculture. And a uh, month later, I found myself in the field right outside of Beijing working with his team, collaborating on a wonderful project, um, empowering small-scale organic farmers uh, in China. And that in itself was an incredible experience. Um, but at that time, since I was in China, I was like, well, why not go check out the startup scene here? Um, you know, I've done startups before, let's, let's see how it's different. And uh, signed up for a bunch of meetups, and I happened to run into a serial entrepreneur who just sold his last startup. And he just so happened to be looking for a design co-founder who had worked on, um, in an education space um, who was bilingual and bicultural. Guess, guess who filled uh, <laughs> that criteria? I was like, well, what are the chances? Um, and so we basically had coffee for you know, a couple of weeks and just decided to make the leap and start collaborating on a company together. And 12 months later, we had a company of 13 developers and designers and marketers. I was flying between Beijing and San Francisco and um, cities in Canada doing product design, marketing, fundraising, pitching to VCs, and it was really, really wonderful. And um, eventually we did launch with over 500 students at the top bilingual schools in the US and China. Um, and that was just such a, just a proud moment for um, me and my team. And I reflect back on that and I think, wow, like. All of this was really just started with me deciding to stay for that 
that event in San Francisco. If I didn't decide to stay, if I didn't decide to go chat with that um, keynote, and I didn't decide to hop on that plane to Beijing, I never would have had this incredible experience. And um, I would encourage you all to think about how we can make these small intentional acts just a part of our daily life. Um, live a life of why not rather than why. Why not follow up with that person you thought was a great speaker at the, the Blend Conference? <laughs> you know, why not pick up that book that's been catching your eye at every bookstore? Um, you know, why not go to that event that your friends have been asking you to go to? Because you really never know where those small intentional acts will eventually lead you. So, I unfortunately cannot tell the future for all of you. You're all going to be writing um, some really fascinating chapters of your life very soon, I'm, I'm sure. Um, much more than I could even imagine. Um, but what I do know is true. From my own experiences, um, following these four things will help you more easily overcome those hurdles that are going to be in front of you and will help you make the most of those opportunities that will come flying at you. So just to recap, if you're on a ledge, it's time for you to jump. You hold the keys to your own cage. Put your own oxygen mask on first, and great opportunities are sparked by small acts of intention. So please go forth and fly, my little birds, <laughs> and um, maybe start uh, on that small act of intention and uh, message me on Twitter or email me. I'm happy to answer any questions if you're exploring new careers, if you have any particular personal struggles that, um, uh, that you think I can relate to. Um, my door is always open to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your honesty and just the, the revealing. I think often at conferences like this, we don't actually um, talk much about the struggles and the challenges we face as designers. You say you often see great case studies, and then you're often left to wonder, wow, the, everyone else is doing great work. What about me? So thank you very much for taking us through that journey and really revealing something. And I think a lot of the struggles you face are things that, that many of us, ex especially experienced folks, have, have struggled with as well. Does anyone have a question for... Uh, for Jess. Hi. Um, oh. <laughs> um, I also want to say thank you for being like so honest about you know your journey, your emotional journey, your mental journey. It's not just about the successes; it's about like how you got there. So, I just want to say thank you, just like Marcus said. And also, I wanted to ask you what your first startup was, because I know you talked about you've done a few of them. And you briefly touched on some of them, but I'm just really interested to know what your first one was and how that kind of started yes. in like a nutshell. Oh, I'm know. happy to share. Um, I know we didn't have that much time, and I could go on and on about all of these um, amazing opportunities, again, came from those small acts of intention. Um, but my very first startup was called uh, Penopal, and it's an edu tech startup based here in Toronto. And it's um, a series of language learning games to teach kids Mandarin, French, and English. And now we have over a million users that are on it. And um, so the, the origin of that story is also really interesting. And um, it's kind of funny thinking back on it. Um, I actually was volunteering at a local hospital while I was in university. And I saw how, um, how much dementia patients were suffering and how poor the care for them um, is. And so uh, I ended up signing up for a social entrepreneurship class in my school to try to help solve some issues around senior health care. And while I was doing that, I heard about this wonderful uh, program called The Next 36. How many of you have heard of The Next 36? I'm curious. Oh, great. Um, so for those of you who don't know, it's an entrepreneurship program uh, specifically for undergraduate students. And I believe now it's, it's changed since then, but uh, they've also extended that to people who are newly graduated. Um, so I heard about the Next 36 program, and I ended up applying for it. And it was my experience at the hospital and through my social entrepreneurship class that really helped me stand out. And, and uh, one of the reasons why they let me in, and I was part of that cohort, um, and working on a senior healthcare startup um, 
was the very first idea that my team and I came up with through that program. But you know, as you know, the first idea you have uh, in the design process isn't ever the, the right idea. And through a lot of iterations and a lot of evolution, we ended up with this education app. So it was also through a lot of these random occurrence, seemingly random occurrences that led to um, that first startup. What are you up to now? Good question. Um, so I've recently transitioned into a new team at a consultancy called Rios Partners. And so we are a systems change consultancy. And the project that I'm working on right now is with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we're working together to solve um, this, this challenge around um, emergency financial aid for the over 3 million university students in the states that drop out every year because they have a shortfall in a couple hundred dollars in cash. And uh, so it's systemic because we need to work with a lot of different stakeholders and organizations in order to tackle a problem as big as this.